These are the answers to the AP Chemistry packet that covers topics 3.2 to 3.4. On this slide, you can see Unit 3 at a glance. Unit 3 is entitled Intermolecular Forces and Properties. In this video, we will take a look at topic 3.2, Properties of Solids, topic 3.3, Solids, Liquids, and Gases, and topic 3.4, Ideal Gas Law. In the video description area, there is a link to the AP Chemistry course and exam description, which we call the CED for short, and there is also a link to the packet that accompanies this video. Topic 3.2, Properties of Solids. Here are some essential knowledge statements from the AP Chemistry course and exam description. Many properties of liquids and solids are determined by the strengths and types of intermolecular forces present. Because intermolecular interactions are broken when a substance vaporizes, the vapor pressure and boiling point are directly related to the strength of those interactions. Melting points also tend to correlate with interaction strength, but because the interactions are only rearranged in melting, the relations can be more subtle. Particulate level representations showing multiple interacting chemical species are a useful means to communicate or understand how intermolecular interactions help to establish macroscopic properties. Due to strong interactions between ions, ionic solids tend to have low vapor pressures, high melting points, and high boiling points. They tend to be brittle due to the repulsion of like charges caused when one layer slides across another layer. They conduct electricity only when the ions are mobile, as when the ionic solid is melted or dissolved in water or another solvent. In covalent network solids, the atoms are covalently bonded together in a three-dimensional network, for example, diamond, or layers of two-dimensional networks, for example, graphite. These are only formed from nonmetals, elemental, for example, diamond and graphite, or binary compounds of two nonmetals, for example, silicon dioxide and silicon carbide. Due to the strong covalent interactions, covalent solids have high melting points. Three-dimensional network solids are also rigid and hard because the covalent bond angles are fixed. However, graphite is soft because adjacent layers can slide past each other relatively easily. Molecular solids are composed of distinct individual units of covalently bonded molecules attracted to each other through relatively weak intermolecular forces. Molecular solids generally have a low melting point because of the relatively weak intermolecular forces present between the molecules. They do not conduct electricity because their valence electrons are tightly held within the covalent bonds and the lone pairs of each constituent molecule. Molecular solids are sometimes composed of very large molecules or polymers. Metallic solids are good conductors of electricity and heat due to the presence of free valence electrons. They also tend to be malleable and ductile due to the ease with which the metal cores can rearrange their structure. In an interstitial alloy, interstitial atoms tend to make the lattice more rigid decreasing malleability and ductility. Alloys typically retain a sea of mobile ele electrons and so remain conducting. In large biomolecules or polymers, non-covalent interactions may occur between different molecules or between different regions of the same large biomolecule. The functionality and properties of such molecules depend strongly on the shape of the molecule which is largely dictated by non-covalent interactions. Here we have a diagram on the left that represents a beaker and a close-up view of what's happening at the surface. So the first diagram shown at the right in your packet represents a sample of pure water in a beaker at room temperature. The close-up view shows a particulate model of H2O molecules near the surface of the liquid. The molecules in the liquid phase are moving at different speeds and have a range of values for kinetic energy. Some of the molecules near the surface have sufficient energy to overcome the intermolecular forces between them. They can escape the liquid phase and enter the space above the liquid surface. 
Eventually, the beaker will become dry when the sample of water evaporates completely. Now we have a different diagram with a flask that is sealed. So this second diagram shows a sample of pure water in a sealed flask at room temperature. The arrows in the close-up view indicate that molecules undergo both evaporation and condensation. A point is reached in this sealed container in which the rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation. This is a state of dynamic equilibrium. As long as the temperature remains constant, the number of water molecules in the gas phase remains constant. Number one, the vapor pressure of a liquid is defined as the pressure exerted by a gas in equilibrium with its liquid phase at a given temperature. The table above shows the vapor pressure of water at various temperatures. Explain why the vapor pressure of water, or any liquid for that matter, will increase when the temperature of the liquid increases. Discuss the kinetic energy of the particles in your answer. So what's going on here is that when the temperature of a sample of matter increases, the average kinetic energy of the particles of matter increase. And when liquid molecules change into a gas, they have to overcome the attractive forces between the particles of the liquid. So giving that sample of matter more energy is going to allow a greater fraction of those molecules to escape from the liquid to the gas. So when the temperature of the liquid increases, the average kinetic energy of the particles increases. At a higher temperature, a greater fraction of the particles have sufficient energy to overcome the intermolecular attractive forces and escape the liquid. This results in a greater number of gas particles in the space above the liquid surface and a higher vapor pressure. So a higher temperature, higher kinetic energy, and then higher vapor pressure. So unlike question one, in which we were taking a sample of water and raising the temperature of the water, in question two, we're looking at two different flasks of different liquids at the same temperature. So on the left, we see water at 20 degrees Celsius, and the vapor pressure is 17.5 torr. On the right, we see ethanol also at 20 degrees Celsius, and the vapor pressure is 44.6 torr. So let's go ahead and answer question two. We have parts A, B, and C. Part A, which substance, water or ethanol, appears to evaporate more easily at 20 degrees Celsius? Well, in the particle diagram, as well as the fact that the vapor pressure, 44.6, is higher than that of water at that same temperature, you can see that there are more gas molecules above the liquid surface for that flask of ethanol. So the answer to part A is ethanol seems to evaporate more easily at 20 degrees Celsius. Part B, which substance, water or ethanol, is more likely to experience stronger intermolecular attractive forces in the liquid phase? And that's going to be water, because if there are fewer molecules of water vapor above the surface, then it must be more difficult for the water to change from a liquid to a gas. So more energy is required for water molecules to overcome the intermolecular forces in the liquid phase and enter the gas phase. Stronger intermolecular forces for water is going to lead to a higher boiling point. So it's going to require more energy to turn water from a liquid to a gas. Now there is this inverse relationship between the vapor pressure and the boiling point. Let's take a look at question three. When comparing two different liquids at the same temperature, the liquid that has a, so for example, water on the left had a lower vapor pressure, it should have a higher boiling point. But you could have answered question three in the opposite direction and still been correct. Focusing on the ethanol, ethanol had a higher vapor pressure and then had a, should have a lower boiling point. All right, let me define these two terms which are slightly different from each other. The boiling point of a liquid is defined as the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the external pressure surrounding the liquid. The normal boiling point of a liquid refers to the situation in which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to standard atmospheric pressure at sea level. 
which is usually defined as one atmosphere or 760 torr. In the video description area, there is a link to a video in which water is able to boil at approximately 22 degrees Celsius, and that's because a vacuum pump is used to lower the pressure above the surface of the liquid. So here we have a graph of vapor pressure on the y-axis versus temperature in Celsius on the x-axis. So when we look at this graph, we can find on the y-axis the standard atmospheric pressure, so 760 torr, and then we follow it down to, there's one curve for ethanol and there's one curve for water. So for water, if we follow that intersection of at what point does the vapor pressure of the liquid equal 760 torr, and that's when the temperature of the water is 100 degrees Celsius. So 100 degrees Celsius is the normal boiling point of the liquid. But in the video, here's a close-up view of that same curve. If they can get the pressure really, really low with that vacuum pump, then the temperature at which water will come to a boil can be approximately in the mid-20s, about 20, 25 degrees Celsius. So that would be lowering the pressure above the surface of the liquid. That is not the normal boiling point, but it is a temperature at which water will boil. Now the question four is asking about ethanol. So the normal boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. Use the information in the diagram to estimate the normal boiling point for ethanol. So when we follow the 760 torr to the curve for ethanol, and then look at the temperature in which that vapor pressure of ethanol is equal to 760 torr, that is approximately around 78 degrees Celsius. That's the normal boiling point of ethanol. So in the next part of this video, I'd like to talk about the four types of solids. Ionic, covalent network, molecular, and metallic. Particulate level representations showing multiple interacting chemical species are a useful means to communicate or understand how intermolecular interactions help to establish macroscopic properties. So here are particulate level representations of the four different types of solid. We have ionic. Due to strong interactions between ions, ionic solids tend to have low vapor pressures, high melting points, and high boiling points. They tend to be brittle due to the repulsion of like charges caused when one layer slides across another layer. They conduct electricity only when the ions are mobile, as when the ionic solid is melted or dissolved in water or another solvent. And then we have covalent network. In covalent network solids, atoms are covalently bonded together into a three-dimensional network such as diamond or layers of two-dimensional networks such as graphite. These are only formed from nonmetals, elemental like diamond and graphite, or binary compounds of two nonmetals such as silicon dioxide and silicon carbide. Due to the strong covalent interactions, covalent solids have high melting points. Three-dimensional network solids are also rigid and hard because the covalent bond angles are fixed. However, graphite is soft because adjacent layers can slide past each other relatively easily. So here's a close-up view of diamond and graphite. Diamond on the left, graphite on the right. So for Diamond, each carbon atom is bonded to four other carbon atoms with tetrahedral geometry around the carbon atoms. There are covalent bonds between atoms in all directions, making diamond a hard, rigid solid with a very high melting point. In graphite, the carbon atoms form thin layers. In each layer, each carbon atom is bonded to three other carbon atoms in a pattern of interconnected hexagons. The layers have relatively weak intermolecular attractions between them and the layers can slide past each other relatively easily. The next type of solid is molecular. Molecular solids are composed of distinct individual units of covalently bonded molecules attracted to each other through relatively weak intermolecular forces. Molecular solids generally have a low melting point because of the relatively weak intermolecular forces present between the molecules. They do not conduct electricity. 
because their valence electrons are tightly held within the covalent bonds and the lone pairs of each constituent molecule. Molecular solids are sometimes composed of very large molecules or polymers. And then metallic solids. Metallic solids are good conductors of electricity and heat due to the presence of free valence electrons. They also tend to be malleable and ductile due to the ease with which the metal cores can rearrange their structure. In an interstitial alloy, interstitial atoms tend to make the lattice more rigid, decreasing malleability and ductility. Alloys retain a sea of mobile electrons and so remain conducting. There are four different types of solids that you should be familiar with in AP Chemistry. Descriptions of each type of solid are shown in the table below with type of solid and then particles, attractions between particles, electrical conductivity, melting point, and then other properties and examples. So for ionic, the particles are positive and negative ions. The attractions between the particles are the electrostatic attractions between oppositely charged ions. As far as conductivity, it does not conduct elect electricity as a solid because the ions cannot move freely. But it does conduct electricity when melted or dissolved in a solvent because the ions can move freely. For melting point, relatively high. Other properties include a hard, brittle solid. And examples are lithium bromide, LIBR, sodium nitrate, NaNO3, magnesium oxide, MgO, potassium chloride, KCl, copper Roman numeral II sulfate, CuSO4, and lead Roman numeral II iodide, PbI2. Examples of covalent network solids are diamond, graphite, silicon, quartz, so quartz is SiO2, silicon carbide, SiC, and boron nitride. The particles are atoms. The attractions between the particles are covalent bonds between the atoms in a large extended network. Conductivity does not conduct electri electricity because valence electrons are localized in these covalent bonds. Melting point, relatively high, and a hard, rigid solid. So as far as examples of covalent network solids, there's about six different examples. I would be familiar with them. Diamond, graphite, silicon, SiO2, so quartz, SiC, silicon carbide, and then Bn, boron nitride. Now for molecular, there's lots and lots of examples. So molecular solids are composed of molecules. The attractions between the particles are the inter- molecular attractions, so between the molecules, does not conduct electricity because the electrons are localized in covalent bonds. The individual particles are neutral molecules, so no ions, no free electrons. Melting point is relatively low because of the weak intermolecular forces. It's a relatively soft solid as opposed to a hard, rigid solid. And examples include iodine, so I2, carbon dioxide, CO2, methylene chloride or dichloromethane, CH2Cl2, water, H2O, naphthalene, which is C10H8, and glucose or fructose, which is C6H12O6. Lastly, metallic solids. The particles are positive metal cations, the nucleus plus the core electrons, and then the valence electrons, which we know are mobile and can move. As far as attractions between particles, it would be attractions between these positive metal cations and the C of delocalized mobile valence electrons. They do conduct electricity as a solid because of the mobile valence electrons. The melting points vary over a wide range, so maybe low or high, but there's no general uh, value. And then the malleable and ductile represent properties of metals. So malleable and ductile, they can be hammered into flat sheets and they can be stretched into long, thin wires. Examples of metallic solids, sodium, Na, magnesium, Mg, aluminum, Al, nickel, N Ni, copper, Cu, zinc, Zn. All right, question five. When a sample of solid diamond, so that's carbon, melts, 
Covalent bonds are broken. However, when a sample of solid H2O melts, covalent bonds are not broken. Explain. So the best way to answer this question is to first identify the type of solid for each substance and then talk about the attractions between the particles in each substance. So diamond is a covalent network solid, whereas water is a molecular solid. In a covalent network solid, the structure consists of an extended network of covalent bonds between the atoms. So when a sample of solid diamond melts, some of these covalent bonds between the carbon atoms are broken. Since water is a molecular solid, the structure consists of individual water molecules that are held together with intermolecular attractive forces. When a sample of solid H2O melts, we're not breaking covalent bonds, but rather the attractive forces in between the water molecules. So identifying the type of solid and then the attractive forces that are broken between the particles, that helps you answer this question. Question six, we have a table with solid A, B, C, and D, and then we have descriptions of the physical appearance. We have the melting point, conductivity, and solubility. Part A, based on this information, classify each of the four solids into one of the following types, metallic, ionic, covalent network, and molecular. Well, the first thing that jumps out at me in this table is solid D conducts electricity as a solid, and there's only one type of solid that can do that. So a metallic solid is the only one of the four types that can be a conductor of electricity as a solid because of the mobile valence electrons. So solid D should be metallic. The next thing that jumps out at me from this table is the fact that solid C is able to conduct electricity when dissolved in water. There's only one type of solid that will do that, and that's an ionic solid, which does not conduct electricity as a solid because the ions cannot move freely, but when dissolved in water, it is able to conduct electricity because now the ions can move and flow freely. So solid C is ionic. Well, now it comes down to solid A and B, which one is molecular and which one is covalent network. So the focus here would be on the difference in the melting point. So for a covalent network solid, it has a relatively high melting point because of the strong covalent bonds in all directions whereas a molecular solid has a relatively low melting point because of the relatively weak intermolecular attractive forces in between the molecules. So the lower melting point, solid A, should be molecular, and the higher melting point, solid B, should be covalent network. Part B of this question is that now that we've identified the type of solid, we are given that they are, in no particular order, silicon, Si, nickel, Ni, naphthalene, C10H8, and potassium chloride, KCl. So make a prediction for the most likely identity of each solid. So silicon is one of those examples that I had already mentioned earlier. So there's a relatively small list of examples of covalent network solids I would encourage you to just be familiar with these examples because that's the best way to know what we're talking about. With respect to the next uh, solid type, it says nickel, Ni. Here is a diagram of the metals, nonmetals, and metalloid. Technically, Si, silicon, is a semi-metal or a metalloid, but in general, you can see that those black and gray classifications on the right side of the periodic table, boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium are metalloids, but nonmetals would include carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, selenium, bromine, iodine, and all the noble gases. Hydrogen is also a nonmetal. So the vast majority of the elements in the periodic table are classified as metals, potassium, titanium, manganese, iron, and of course nickel is definitely an example of a metal. Now for the next example it says naphthalene C10H8. If I have carbon and hydrogen which are 
both classified as nonmetals, when they form compounds, generally two or more nonmetals will produce covalent molecular compounds. So that's going to make naphthalene the molecular solid. And of course, that last example, potassium chloride is metal and nonmetal. So when you typically see a binary compound composed of two elements where one is a metal and one is a nonmetal, like this example, that should be an ionic solid. All right, we've classified in part A the four types of solids based on the properties. We've identified based on the chemical formula the four types of solids. And now moving on to question seven. Question seven says, use principles of interparticle forces to explain the difference in the properties of the two substances shown in the table above. So the first substance is SiH4 and the second substance is SiO2. We can tell looking at the numbers for melting point and boiling point that SiO2 has a much higher melting point and boiling point than SiH4. If you don't know about how to go from Celsius to Kelvin or what room temperature represents, I'll tell you that room temperature is approximately 25 degrees Celsius or about 300 Kelvin. So the fact that SiH4 boils at 161 Kelvin, it turns out that SiH4 is actually a gas at room temperature. So you'd have to cool it down to become a liquid and eventually cool it down even more to have it freeze. SiO2 melts at a very high temperature and obviously boils at an even higher temperature. So SiO2 is a solid at room temperature with strong attractive forces. And SiH4 is a gas at room temperature with very weak attractive forces between the particles. So SiH4 is very similar to a compound called methane, CH4, also a gas at room temperature. SiH4 consists of molecules. Individual particles of SiH4 with relatively weak intermolecular attractive forces between the molecules. And since it's a nonpolar molecule, it would experience only London dispersion forces. On the other hand, SiO2 is one of the examples I asked you to memorize. Diamond, graphite, silicon, quartz, SiO2, and then silicon carbide and boron nitride. So since SiO2 is an example of a covalent network solid, atoms of silicon and oxygen, extended network of strong covalent bonds between the atoms. So we have to explain the difference in properties. Since SiH4 is composed of molecules and experiences relatively weak London dispersion forces in between those molecules, and SiO2 is a network covalent compound with strong covalent bonds between the atoms of silicon and oxygen, that explains why the difference in properties. The LDFs, or London dispersion forces, are much weaker than the covalent bonds. So the attractive forces between the particles in SiO2 are much stronger than the attractive forces between the particles in SiH4. So SiO2 has a much higher melting point and boiling point than SiH4, much stronger interparticle attractive forces. Question eight. The structures and melting points for methyl salicylate on the left and salicylic acid on the right are shown above. The same three types of intermolecular forces, London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonding forces exist among molecules of each substance. Explain why the melting point of salicylic acid, which is 159 Celsius, is much higher than that of methyl salicylate, which is negative nine degrees Celsius. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is compare the relative size of the electron cloud for each molecule. I'm gonna start by counting carbon atoms. So for methyl salicylate, that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbon atoms. And then I see eight hydrogen atoms and three oxygen atoms. So C8H8O3. For the salicylic acid molecule on the right, I'll start counting the carbon atoms. One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven carbon atoms. I see six hydrogen atoms and three oxygen atoms. So C7H6O3. So they're very similar, but I would say methyl salicylate has a slightly larger electron cloud. Well, the size of the electron cloud or the relative strength of the London dispersion forces is not going to help us here. It's not going to explain why the salicylic acid molecule, which is on the right, actually has a much higher melting point than the methyl salicylate on the left. So size of the electron cloud is not going to help me here. I don't think dipole-dipole interactions are going to be very different. These are both polar molecules, but something special is going to happen with respect to hydrogen bonding interactions between molecules. So let's take a look. How do I explain why salicylic acid on the right has a higher melting point than methyl salicylate on the left? Now, there are eight hydrogen atoms in methyl salicylate, but only one of them is directly bonded to oxygen. So that hydrogen atom that I'm highlighting in that molecule on the left it can participate in hydrogen bonding attractions with neighboring molecules. If I look at the salicylic acid, I see actually two different hydrogens that are directly bonded to oxygen. So there are two different locations in the same molecule in which a hydrogen bonding interaction between molecules can occur. So I have one hydrogen bonding site in methyl salicylate, and I have two hydrogen bonding sites in salicylic acid. So that's the important distinctive feature that's going on here. Molecules of salicylic acid have more hydrogen bonding sites than molecules of methyl salicylate. So therefore, this leads to stronger intermolecular forces, attractive forces between the molecules, and a higher melting point for salicylic acid. Okay, now it's time to move from topic 3.2 to topic 3.3. Topic 3.3, solids, liquids, and gases. Here are the essential knowledge statements from the AP Chemistry course and exam description. Solids can be crystalline, where the particles are arranged in a regular three-dimensional structure, or they can be amorphous, where the particles do not have a regular orderly arrangement. In both cases, the motion of the individual particles is limited, and the particles do not undergo overall translation with respect to each other. The structure of the solid is influenced by interparticle interactions and the ability of the particles to pack together. So that has to do with solid particles being relatively close to each other and not moving around very much. The constituent particles in liquids are in close contact with each other, and they are continually moving and colliding. The arrangement and movement of particles are influenced by the nature and strength of the forces, for example, polarity, hydrogen bonding, and temperature between the particles. The solid and liquid phases for a particular substance typically have similar molar volume, because in both phases, the constituent particles are in close contact at all times. So again, the message so far is that the particles of solid and liquid are fairly close together, although liquid particles can move a little bit more than solids. And then finally, in the gas phase, the particles are in constant motion. Their frequencies of collision and the average spacing between them are dependent on temperature, pressure, and volume. Because of this constant motion and minimal effects of forces between particles, a gas has neither a definite volume nor definite shape. So here's a particulate diagram of a solid, a liquid, and a gas for six molecules of nitrogen. So solids and liquids pretty close together, gases farther apart. So looking at topic 3.3, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention in this video. So I don't have any example problems for this. I'm going to move on from topic 3.3, so relatively brief and straightforward, to topic 3.4. Topic 3.4 is on the ideal gas law. Here are the essential knowledge statements from the AP Chemistry course and exam description. 
The macroscopic properties of ideal gases are related through the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. In a sample containing a mixture of ideal gases, the pressure exerted by each component, the partial pressure of the gas, is independent of the other components of that mixture. Therefore, the total pressure of the sample is the sum of the partial pressures. So the partial pressure of one gas is equal to the total pressure times what's called the mole fraction. So x, or the Greek letter chi, sub a, that's the ratio, the mole fraction of the moles of one gas divided by the total moles. And the equation total pressure is the sum of the individual partial pressures of gas A, gas B, gas C, etc. Those equations come from the equation sheet. Graphical representations of the relationships between pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles are useful to describe gas behavior. So now I want to talk about the properties of an ideal gas. And in the video description area, there is a link to the FET website, specifically the FET simulation on properties of gases. So gas particles are in constant random rapid motion. Gases expand to fill their container completely. Again, you can see a video clip of the particle representation for gas particles. Two or more gases will form a homogeneous mixture when they are combined together. So when the dividing barrier between these two different gases is removed, you can see that the gases will, because of their random motion and collisions, eventually form a homogeneous mixture when they are combined together. Gases are highly compressible. So in this video clip, you can see that the volume of the gas is reduced, and that's because there's lots of empty space between the particles, so that gas can be compressed. The volume of the gas particles themselves is negligible compared to the volume occupied by the gas, so lots of empty space between the particles. Collisions of gas particles are perfectly elastic, meaning that energy is transferred, so some energy is transferred between particles, but not lost during collisions. There are no attractive or repulsive forces between the gas particles. Now, if you visit the AP Chemistry course and exam description, on the final pages, you'll see a copy of the AP Chemistry Equations and Constants sheet. So here is a portion of the AP Chemistry Equations and Constants sheet that includes information about gases. PV equals nRT, the ideal gas law. The partial pressure of one gas in a mixture is equal to the total pressure times the mole fraction, the ratio of the moles of one gas divided by the total moles of the gas mixture. The total pressure of a gas mixture is equal to the sum of the individual partial pressures of each gas in the mixture. If you have to go from degrees Celsius to Kelvins, you add 273. And in the lower right corner, you can see two different versions of the ideal gas constant R. There's 0 0.08206 and there's 62.36. The difference between those values has to do with one of them is in units of atmospheres for pressure. The other is in units of torr for pressure. But volume is in liters, number of moles is in units of moles, and temperature is in Kelvin. There's also a conversion factor between atmospheres and millimeters of mercury, which is also known as TOR. And there's information about STP, or standard temperature and pressure. Here are some relationships between gas variables. So I have pressure and volume, pressure and temperature, pressure and number of moles, volume and number of moles, and volume and temperature. And I will use the FET simulation to illustrate these relationships. So here is pressure and volume. Pressure is inversely proportional to volume, and the constant variables are the number of particles, or the number of moles, and the temperature. So in this video clip, you can see that when the volume of the container is decreased by half, the pressure of the gas is doubled. 
So what's not changing is the number of particles and the temperature of the gas. You can see a graphical relationship showing that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. Now, for all of the other relationships that I'm going to show you in this section of the video, they're all direct relationships, where as one variable increases, the other variable also increases. So what's happening in this video clip is that I started with a temperature of 300 Kelvin, and the pressure was approximately about 5.5 or 6 atmospheres. Then, when I heated the gas from 300 Kelvin to 600 Kelvin, then the pressure was doubled to approximately 12 atmospheres. So the number of moles and the volume of the container are constant in this relationship. The next relationship here is between pressure and number of moles. So in this video clip, what I'm doing is I'm clicking on the button to add more particles of gas to the container. So when I go from 50 gas particles to 100 gas particles, the pressure of the gas doubles. What's constant is the volume, so it's a rigid container, and what's also constant is the temperature. So a direct relationship between pressure and number of moles, or number of particles. Now we have a direct relationship between volume and number of particles. So in this video clip, when I click on the button to double the number of particles, the volume of the container is also doubled. So I'm holding the conditions of constant temperature and constant pressure. So as I add more moles of particles to the container, it expands so that volume and number of moles are directly proportional pressure and temperature are constant. And then here we have volume and temperature directly proportional. So now what I'm doing here is I'm heating the gas from a temperature of 300 Kelvin to a temperature of 600 Kelvin, and the volume occupied by the gas doubles. So what's constant is the pressure, and what's constant is the number of moles or number of particles. So when I heat the gas, and I double the Kelvin temperature, the volume of the gas is also doubled. So lots of different relationships between variables, and again, I'm using the FET simulation to illustrate those relationships. All right, this is question nine. Question nine says, a student was assigned the task of determining the molar mass of an unknown gas. The student measured the mass of a sealed 843 milliliter rigid flask that contained dry air. The student then flushed the flask with the unknown gas, resealed it, and measured the mass again. Both the air and the unknown gas were at 23.0 degrees Celsius and 750 torr. The data for the experiment are shown in the table below. Part A. Calculate the mass in grams of the dry air that was in the sealed flask. So if we take the volume of the sealed flask, 843 milliliters, and we take that last bit of information that was in parentheses, the density of dry air is 1.18 grams per liter at this particular temperature and pressure, we can combine volume and density to calculate the mass. So because of the units, milliliters can go into liters, and then using density as a conversion factor, I can go from liters to grams. So there's 1.18 grams for every one liter of dry air. First, I'll go from milliliters to liters using my knowledge of the metric system. So there's 1,000 milliliters in one liter. And then I'll say 1.18 grams for every one liter. If I do this math, 843 divided by 1,000 times 1.18, I get on my calculator 0 0.99474 grams. I will round this answer off to three significant figures based on the measurements that I was given. So 0 0.995 is my answer to part A. Moving on to part B, calculate the mass in grams of the sealed flask itself. That is, if it had no air in it. 
Well, if we just figured out that the mass of the dry air is 0 0.995 grams, and we know that the mass of the sealed flask plus the dry air is 157.70 grams, then all we have to do is subtract those two values. So when I do this, I get 156.705, but since my scale only goes out to two decimal places, I'm going to round this answer off to two decimal places. So I'll say 156.71 grams is my answer to part B. In part C, it says calculate the mass of the unknown gas that was in the sealed flask. Well, we know the mass of the empty flask with nothing in it is 156.71 grams. We also know that the mass of the sealed flask and the unknown gas is 158.08. So we can subtract those two values. And when we do this, we get the mass of the unknown gas is 1.37 grams. All right, moving on to part D. Now we have an opportunity to use the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. So the units of molar mass are grams per mole. We already have the grams of the unknown gas, but the only way to get the moles is using the ideal gas law with respect to pressure, volume, temperature, and we're going to calculate the number of moles. So the mass of the unknown gas from part C was 1.37 grams. The moles of the unknown gas will come from the ideal gas law. So PV equals nRT. N equals PV over RT. The pressure is 750 torr. The volume is 843 milliliters, but we have to convert that into units of liters to use the ideal gas constant. The Volume has to be in liters, so it's not going to be 843, but rather when we divide by 1,000, that's going to be 0 0.843 liters. With respect to the value of R that we're going to use, it's 62.36 because that is units of pressure in torr, so we have torr. And then the temperature, which was in Celsius, has to be in Kelvin, so we're going to add 273, 23 degrees Celsius plus 273 is 296 Kelvin. So there are my values for pressure, volume, the ideal gas constant R, and the temperature in Kelvin. If we do this math, 750 times 0 0.843 divided by 62.36 divided by 296, we get 0 0.0342 and what I'm doing here is I'm not going to actually round off this value, at least not yet, because they don't want the moles, they want the molar mass, which is grams per mole. So I'm going to leave that number in my calculator with lots of extra digits. I'll take the answer from part C, which was 1.37 grams of the unknown gas, divide it by the number of moles that I got from the ideal gas law. So grams divided by moles gives me an answer, which I will round off to three significant figures. I get 40.0 grams per mole. So my answer to part D is I use the ideal gas law to get moles. I use the answer to part C for the grams, and I did grams divided by moles, 40.0 grams per mole. And because this was an unknown gas, let's take a look at the information in part E and see if we can figure out what this gas was supposed to be. Part E. After the experiment was completed, the instructor informed the student that the unknown gas was carbon dioxide, 44.0 grams per mole. Calculate the percent error in the value of the molar mass calculated in Part D. The way we do percent error, it's the difference between the experimental value, which you got in the laboratory, and the accepted value, which is what it was supposed to be. It doesn't matter whether you do experimental minus accepted or accepted minus experimental because the difference is an absolute value anyway. So you kind of ignore the negative number no matter what you get. But you always divide by the accepted value, as in what it was supposed to be. So we're not going to divide by 40.0. We're going to divide by 44.0 because that's the molar mass of carbon dioxide. 
So 40.0 is what we got in the lab, minus 44.0, which is what the official molar mass was supposed to be for carbon dioxide. That difference divided by 44. And again, it's an absolute value, so there's no negatives. And I get about 9% error. 9.1% error is my answer to part E. All right, moving on to part F. Again, the experimental value was less than the accepted value. So I'm going to say too low because we have two different occurrences. In part F, it says for each of the following two possible occurrences, indicate whether it by itself could have been responsible for the error in the student's experimental result. In other words, would it explain why their experimental value for molar mass was too low? You need not include any calculations with your answer. For each of the possible occurrences, justify your answer. Let's start with occurrence number one. The flask was incompletely flushed with CO2, resulting in some dry air remaining in the flask. Remember that the mass of the sealed flask and dry air was less than the mass of the sealed flask and carbon dioxide. So dry air is actually less dense than carbon dioxide. A sample of a given volume of dry air weighs less than a sample of that same volume of carbon dioxide. Would this cause the experimental value to be too low? And the answer is yes. Dry air weighs less, has a smaller density than CO2. If the gas in the flask were a mixture of CO2 and dry air, because the flask was incompletely flushed. In other words, not all of the dry air molecules were replaced with CO2 molecules. Then the mass inside the flask would be less than the mass of pure CO2. So that would cause the mass to be too low. And yes, occurrence number one could have been responsible for the error in the student's results in this experiment. Now with occurrence number two, it says the temperature of the air was 23 degrees Celsius but the temperature of the CO2 was actually less or lower than 23. So we're talking about colder than 23 degrees Celsius. So what does temperature have to do with mass? If a gas sample is at a lower temperature, how does this affect the density of the gas? You may know that hot air balloons rise because the hot air at a higher temperature is less dense than the surrounding air at a colder lower temperature. So this is the relationship between volume and temperature. It's a direct relationship. So gases expand when you heat them and gases contract when you cool them down. So a cold gas will be more dense than a hot gas. As temperature decreases, volume decreases. A colder sample of gas should occupy a smaller volume. And if density is equal to mass divided by volume, a colder sample of gas should be more dense, have a larger density. But that would result in the mass of the gas in the experiment being too high. So if the gas were more dense, it would cause the value to be too heavy. Occurrence number two could not have been responsible for the error in the student's results in this experiment because a colder sample of CO2 would cause the mass to be too high and not too low. All right, last part of this particular question, part G, describe the steps of a laboratory method that a student could use to verify that the volume of the rigid flask is 843 milliliters at this particular temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. So one method is to literally fill up the flask to the brim and then transfer that liquid carefully into a measuring piece of glassware, like a graduated cylinder. So if you fill the flask to the brim with liquid and carefully transfer all of that liquid into a 1,000 milliliter graduated cylinder, if you record the volume, you could see, is it in fact 843 milliliters? Another method is a little bit fancier because it involves not volume measurements, but mass measurements. Remember that density is a way of going from volume to mass or mass to volume. So if you record the mass of the flask with nothing in it, so the empty flask, and then you fill it to the brim and put it back on the scale, you have to fill it to the brim with a liquid of whose density you know, so like water or alcohol or something. And once you fill that flask to the brim, 
you go ahead and put it back on the scale. You measure the mass of the liquid-filled flask. If you subtract, you can find the mass of the liquid, and since mass and density can be combined together to calculate the volume, you could do mass divided by density equals volume, and that would be another way of verifying that the volume of the rigid flask is 843 milliliters. So I would probably choose method number one because I think it's easier just to go ahead and fill the flask with liquid to the brim, then carefully transfer it to a measuring vessel. But another method would be if you knew the density of the liquid, you could convert mass into volume using density as a conversion factor. All right, brand new question. Question 10. A pure sample of a gas has a density of 1.31 grams per liter at a pressure of 1.00 atmospheres and a temperature of 25.0 degrees Celsius. What is the molar mass of this gas? Propose a possible identity of this gas. So normally with the ideal gas law, we need three of the four variables to be able to solve for moles. We would need pressure, which we have, temperature, which we have, and then volume. They didn't actually tell us what the volume of the gas is, but we do have the density, so we can go ahead and just pick whatever volume we want. So I'm looking at the equation sheet. I'm going to use the ideal gas law. I'm going to convert temperature from Celsius to Kelvin by adding 273. And then because the pressure was in atmospheres, I will use for my value of R, 0 0.08206 because that has units of pressure in atmospheres. So PV equals NRT. The density of the gas is 1.31 grams per liter. That means that for every 1.31 grams, there's exactly one liter. Let's assume, for the sake of simplicity, that the volume of the gas is exactly one liter, because that keeps the math very simple. So volume of one liter, pressure of one atmospheres, Temperature of not Celsius, but Kelvin, so 25 plus 273, 298 Kelvin. And if PV equals NRT, let's solve for a number of moles. N equals PV over RT. The reason why we're solving for number of moles is because grams divided by moles is going to give us the molar mass. We already know the grams is 1.31 grams in this particular sample per liter. Let's calculate the number of moles. So pressure, 1.00 atmospheres. Volume, 1.00 liters, because we just decided that was a nice round number to use. The gas constant R, 0 0.08206. And then the temperature in Kelvin, 298. If we do this math, 1 times 1 divided by 0 0.08206 divided by 298, we get our number of moles, which is 0 0.0408933. I'm not going to round off this number of moles just yet because I'm not quite done. It's molar mass, which is grams per mole, as in grams divided by moles. The grams is 1.31. That was the number of grams in one liter of this gas. And one liter was what we used in this calculation. So 1.31 grams divided by the number of moles we got from the ideal gas law, it gives us a molar mass of 32 grams per mole. So this is a very common molar mass you're familiar with on the periodic table. Oxygen has a molar mass of 16 as O, but then O2, diatomic oxygen, O2, has a molar mass of 32. So it says propose a possible identity of this gas. O2 would be the choice that I'm going to pick. Question 11 says a gas mixture contains 14.0 grams of nitrogen gas, N2, and 32.0 grams of oxygen gas, O2. The total pressure of the gas mixture is equal to 1,200 torr. Calculate the partial pressure of each gas in the mixture. So before we talk about the pressure, I think a good first step would be to go from grams to moles. So on the periodic table, you can discover that the Molar mass of nitrogen, N2, is 28 grams per mole. And the molar mass of oxygen, O2, is 32 grams per mole. So if I have 14 grams of nitrogen, that's half a mole. And if I have 32 grams of O2, that is one mole. So we have half a mole of nitrogen gas in this mixture, and we have one mole of oxygen gas in this mixture. 
The total number of moles in the gas mixture is 1.5 moles. On the equation sheet, it says that the partial pressure of one gas in a gas mixture is equal to the total pressure times the mole fraction, where the mole fraction is the moles of one gas, A, divided by the total moles of the gas mixture. So the total number of moles of gas in this mixture is 1.5 moles. The mole fraction of nitrogen would be 0.5 over 1.5, which is one third or 0.333. The mole fraction of oxygen in this mixture would be one over 1.5 or two thirds or 0.667. So one third of the gas in the container in the mixture is nitrogen and two thirds of the gas in the container in the mixture is oxygen. So the partial pressure of nitrogen in this gas mixture is one-third times 1,200, which is 400 torr. The partial pressure of oxygen in this mixture would be two-thirds times 1,200 torr, 800 torr. So it kind of makes sense that the pressure of the oxygen in this gas mixture is twice as much as the pressure of nitrogen in this gas mixture. Since there's twice as many moles of oxygen as compared to nitrogen, then the pressure, the partial pressure of oxygen should be twice as much of, of that of um, nitrogen. Okay, let's move on to number 12. In the diagram above, two flasks are connected by a valve that is closed. The flask on the left contains 10.0 liters of hydrogen gas at a pressure of 3.0 atmospheres. The flask on the right contains 4.0 liters of CH4, methane gas, at a pressure of 2.0 atmospheres. Part A, calculate the total pressure of the system after the valve is opened and the two gases are mixed completely. Assume that the temperature remains constant and that the total volume of the gas mixture would be 10 plus four or 14.0 liters. Now the pressure of the hydrogen on the left is three atmospheres. The pressure on the methane, CH4, on the right is two atmospheres, but we cannot add these two values together. Three plus two equals five, but that's not the answer. That's because each of these gases right now is not in the same container. Each gas occupies a separate container. When the valve is opened, each gas will expand into a larger total volume of 14.0 liters. So whatever the partial pressure of hydrogen is, it's going to be less than three atmospheres. Whatever the partial pressure of methane, CH4, is, it's going to be less than two atmospheres once the valve is open. So how we're going to figure out the total pressure of the system is we're going to remember that there is this inverse relationship between pressure and volume. P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. That's the equation we're going to use that's based on the inverse relationship between pressure and volume. So we're not changing the number of moles of gas and we're not changing the temperature. So it's about pressure and volume. So for hydrogen, the P1, the initial pressure is 3.0 atmospheres. The V1 is that side of the container would be 10.0 liters. Once the valve is opened, the new pressure is, I don't know yet, and the new volume is 14 liters once the hydrogen is allowed to expand. So we're gonna solve for P2 and write that number down. So P1 V1 equals P2 V2, that would be three times 10 equals P2 times 14. 30 divided by 14 is equal to 2.14 atmospheres on my calculator. So therefore I'm saying that the pressure of the hydrogen is 2.14 atmospheres after the valve is opened. Now I have to do P1 V1 equals P2 V2 again, this time for the methane CH4. So for the CH4, it's pressure initially, P1, is two atmospheres. The initial volume before the valve is opened is four liters. The new pressure of methane, CH4, is I don't know yet. And the new volume, once the gas is able to expand on both sides, is 14 liters. So P1 V1 equals P2 V2. Two times four is eight divided by 14. And I get P2 is equal to 0 0.571 atmospheres. That's the partial pressure of CH4, methane, after the valve is opened. So now we're going to add these two values together because the total pressure of the system is equal to the partial pressure of each gas added together. 
So 2.14 plus 0 0.571, and I get 2.71 atmospheres for the answer to part A. I had to do P1 V1 equals P2 V2 twice, once for hydrogen and then again for methane, and then add them together. Part B. The definition of mole fraction is shown above, which is moles of one gas divided by the total number of moles in the mixture. Calculate the mole fraction of hydrogen and methane, so H2 and CH4, in this gas mixture. You might think initially that you don't know how to do this question because they didn't tell you the temperature, so you can't do ideal gas law N equals PV over RT. So how do we solve this if we don't have enough information, if all we have is the partial pressure of each gas? Is that enough? And the answer is yes. The reason why it's enough is because the ratio of pressures is proportional to the ratio of moles. So the mole fraction is equal to the partial pressure of one gas divided by the total pressure of the gas mixture. Because number of moles is proportional to pressure, the pressure ratios is the same as the mole ratios. So instead of saying moles of A, I'm gonna say pressure of A, which is in this case hydrogen. Pressure of hydrogen is 2.14 divided by the total pressure, which is 2.71. Pressure of one gas divided by the total pressure is proportional to the moles so of one gas divided by the total moles. 2.14 atmospheres for hydrogen divided by the total pressure is approximately 0 0.79. There's no units, that is the mole fraction, which is just a decimal. So 0 0.79 is the mole fraction of hydrogen. 0 0.21 is the mole fraction of methane. Again, it's the partial pressure of each gas divided by the total pressure to get the mole fraction. Pressure ratios are the same as mole ratios, assuming constant volume and temperature. 0.79 mole fraction of hydrogen, 0.21 mole fraction of methane. So before I talk about question 13, I want to talk about the technique of water displacement. In the laboratory, water displacement can be used to collect a sample of gas. This technique is appropriate to collect a gas that does not react with water or dissolve very much in water. A collection bottle is prepared that is initially filled with water and inverted in a container of water. Once the gas has been collected, the collection bottle is raised or lowered so that the water level inside the bottle is the same as the water level outside the bottle. This ensures that the gas pressure inside the bottle is equal to the atmospheric pressure outside the bottle. Now the total pressure inside the collection bottle is equal to the sum of the partial pressure of the gas collected, so pressure of the gas, and the vapor pressure of the water, pressure of H2O. So values for the vapor pressure of water at various temperatures can be found in a reference table. So the total pressure is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere, which is the sum of the pressure of the gas you're collecting plus that small amount of the pressure of water vapor, which you can look up in a reference table. Question 13. A sample of butane gas was collected by the method of water displacement. The initial mass of a butane lighter is recorded as 22.24 grams. The temperature of the water bath is 22 degrees Celsius. The barometric pressure in the laboratory is 755.0 torr. After the gas is collected, the mass of the butane lighter is recorded as 22.02 .02 grams. At the end of the experiment, the height of the collection tube is adjusted so that the water levels inside and outside the tube are the same. We are given a table of vapor pressure of water at four different temperatures. Part A, based on the information in the table above, what is the value of the vapor pressure of water under the conditions of this experiment, which would be 22 degrees Celsius? So that would be 22 degrees Celsius for water is 19.83 torr. That's the vapor pressure of water that we have available to us in this reference table. In part B, calculate the partial pressure of the dry, as in without water, butane gas 
that is collected in this experiment. The total pressure would be of the atmosphere in the lab. That's the sum of the partial pressure of the gas collected and the vapor pressure of water. So if I have a total pressure of 755 torr, that's in the laboratory on the day of the experiment, 755 torr is the sum of the butane and the water added together. So I don't know the pressure of the butane, but I know that the pressure of the water is 19.83 torr. So the difference between 755.0 torr and 19.83 torr, that difference is the pressure of the dry butane gas. So I get 735.17. When you collect a gas by water displacement, you always have to subtract the vapor pressure of water from the total pressure, which is typically the atmospheric pressure in the laboratory on that day. 735.17 torr is the answer to part B. Part C, we have the volume, 100.0 milliliters, and they want to know, calculate the moles of butane gas collected in this experiment. Another opportunity to use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. So the ideal gas law is PV equals NRT. The value of R we're going to use is 62.36 because that has units of pressure in Tor. And we do have to add 273 to go from Celsius to Kelvin. So 735.17 Tor, that's the pressure of the butane from part B. The temperature of the gas was 22 degrees Celsius. When we add 273, we get 295 Kelvin. The volume of the gas is not 100.0 liters, but rather 100.0 milliliters. When we convert from milliliters to liters, we divide by 1,000. So the volume of the gas is 0 0.1000 liters. PV equals NRT. Solve for N. N equals PV over RT, where the pressure is 735.17 torr. The volume in liters is 0, 0.1000, that's liters. The R value is 62.36 because the torr will cancel out in terms of units. And the Kelvin temperature is 295 Kelvin. So the number of moles of butane gas is 0, 0.003996. I will do that math, rounding off to about three significant figures. I'm going to call this 0, 0.004. Zero, zero. Again, I got that number by doing 735.17 times 0.1 divided by 62.36 divided by 295. So 0 0.004, that's three significant figures for the number of moles. Part D, calculate the mass of butane gas in the experiment. That's the initial mass of 22.24 for the butane lighter minus the final mass of the butane lighter at the end is 22.02. That's a difference of 0 0.22 grams of butane that was released from the butane lighter in this experiment. To get the molar mass, it will be grams divided by moles. So if we go back and look at the answer for moles, which was part C, we have the grams in part D. So 0.22 grams of butane divided by 0 0.00400 moles, and we get a molar mass of 55 grams per mole. Let's see how that molar mass that is calculated experimentally compares with the accepted value for butane. So 55 grams per mole is our experimental value for the molar mass of butane. Well, since butane is C4H10, the accepted value based on the periodic table is 58.12 grams per mole. We got 55, but the accepted value is 58.12. So we'll take the difference, absolute value of that difference, divided by 58.12. That's the accepted value for the molar mass of butane, and we get approximately 5.4% error. All right, we are now on the last problem in this particular packet. This is question 14. A sample of a pure gaseous hydrocarbon is introduced into a previously evacuated rigid 1.00 liter vessel. Pressure of the gas is 0 0.200 atmospheres at a temperature of 127 degrees Celsius. If we're going to calculate the number of moles in part A, that means that we have a pressure, volume, and temperature. So 
We have all of that to figure out the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. We're going to solve for N, number of moles, N equals PV over RT. And the value of R I will use is the 0 0.08206 because atmospheres are the units of pressure that I was given. So pressure equals 0 0.200 atmospheres. Volume equals 1.00 liters. Temperature in Kelvin after I add 273 is 400 Kelvin. PV equals NRT. N equals PV over RT. So I have 0.2 times 1 divided by 0 0.08206 and divided by 400. So my number of moles of the hydrocarbon is 0 0.006. 093, I'm going to round this off to three significant figures, 0 0.00609. That's my number of moles of the hydrocarbon that was used in this experiment. Part B, oxygen, O2, is introduced into the same vessel containing the hydrocarbon. So we have a pressure of 0 0.200 atmospheres for just the hydrocarbon by itself. And after the addition of O2, the total pressure is 1.40 atmospheres. Remember that the total pressure is the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases. So if I have a total pressure of 1.4, and that is the sum of the hydrocarbon plus oxygen, then I subtract the pressure of the hydrocarbon to get the pressure of the O2. 1.40 minus 0.2, that gives me a pressure of O2. 1.20 atmospheres. I just subtracted total pressure minus the pressure of the hydrocarbon. In part C, it says calculate each of the following quantities, and these are ratios. So what happened in the mixture of the hydrocarbon and O2 is that it was sparked, so a combustion reaction occurs, and it produced CO2 gas and H2O gas. The reaction proceeds to completion so that all of the hydrocarbon is consumed. But at the end of the experiment, there's going to be a little bit of O2 remaining left over or excess in the reaction vessel. The temperature inside the reaction vessel is returned to 127 degrees Celsius, and the partial pressure of each gas in the reaction vessel is either 0.6 atmospheres for carbon dioxide, 0.8 atmospheres for water vapor, and 0.2 atmospheres of the leftover oxygen. So what's nice about this particular question, part C, is that the mole ratio is the same as the pressure ratio. The fact that pressure is directly proportional to moles makes this a pretty easy calculation because the volume of the container is not changing, the temperature in the container is constant, so we can compare the mole ratio to the pressure ratio. Moles of CO2 produced divided by moles of hydrocarbon consumed. That's going to equal the pressure of the CO2 at the end of this experiment divided by the initial pressure of the hydrocarbon at the beginning of this experiment. 0.6 divided by 0.2 is 3. So the ratio of pressures is the same as the ratio of moles. There's 3 moles of CO2 produced for every 1 mole of hydrocarbon consumed. And then for water, it's pressure of water divided by the pressure of the hydrocarbon. That's going to be 0.8 atmospheres divided by 0.2 atmospheres. That is a 4 to 1 ratio. There is 4 moles of water produced for every 1 mole of hydrocarbon consumed. Pressure ratios, same as mole ratios. Well, now that we know that the pressure ratio is equal to the mole ratio and that there are three moles of CO2 produced for every one mole of hydrocarbon consumed, I'm going to stick in a coefficient of three into the balanced equation. I don't know the chemical formula of the hydrocarbon, but I know that there's three moles of CO2 for every one mole of the hydrocarbon. Similarly, I can tell that there's a four to one ratio between moles of H2O and moles of hydrocarbon because pressure ratios are the same as mole ratios in this problem. And so now with coefficients of 3 and 4 in this combustion equation, there are three 
moles of carbon for every eight moles of hydrogen atoms. So there's three moles of carbon atoms for every eight moles of hydrogen atoms. That means that the formula, the chemical formula of the hydrocarbon is C3H8. And then to balance the equation, I already have carbon and hydrogen balanced, but there are 10 oxygen atoms on the right. Let's put a five in front of the CO2. So this is our balanced chemical equation. And we did that by figuring out that there were three moles of CO2 for every one mole of the hydrocarbon. There's four moles of H2O for every one mole of the hydrocarbon. So that's how we got the coefficients and balanced the equation and figured out the chemical formula of the hydrocarbon. Now that we know it's C3H8, we go back to our answer from earlier in this problem. The number of moles of the hydrocarbon that was consumed was 0 0.00609 from part A. Let's go find C3H8 molar mass from the periodic table. So C3H8 has a molar mass of 44.094 grams per mole, just by adding up the atomic masses of three carbons and eight hydrogens. Let's go from moles to grams using the molar mass. So 0 0.00609 moles from part A times the molar mass from the periodic table for this particular um, hydrocarbon, C3H8. And we do this math and we get 0 0.26852. I'm going to round this off to three significant figures, 0 0.269 grams. This particular part, part E, was the last part of question 14. It was also the last question in this particular packet. So this is the end of the video. I hope that you found the answers and explanations helpful. Thanks for watching.